Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, once again. Good morning if you're elsewhere. Good evening if you're even further around the world. Welcome to another of our monthly question and answer sessions that I do so love and enjoy sharing with you. We have a great week of things going on. Uh, there's another presentation with Ellie tomorrow. And then on Friday, we have our usual Fridays Live. And there are some really interesting and exciting records I can't wait to talk to you about because I'll be there on Friday. And We've already got some great questions. Today is all about any of your brick walls, any of the things that you want to look at and explore in more detail when it comes to family history. We're going to open it up and we're going to see what we can find, and maybe hopefully break through those together. So you can ask questions anytime. There are plenty of uh, opportunities for you to uh, get those questions in. And then also there are plenty of people who've already submitted questions in advance. So whichever way you did it, you can always submit questions in advance when you see the notification of this event taking place. Drop your questions in there. But that doesn't mean that you can't ask them on the day as well. So whichever you prefer, you can do that with no problem. So we're, we're always happy with that. And then, of course, there's a great community here as well that might also have some great answers. So anytime there's the question and answer session. And uh, yes, uh, Sally, I see you. Did you catch me napping? Not quite. There was someone at my door, which... Uh, always happens at the worst possible moment, doesn't it? So they kept me away for a minute or so. But uh, we luckily managed to uh, round that off pretty quickly. So uh, let's take a look. We've got some questions, as you see. Um, I said, Ellie is saying, uh, she's in the comments. Anyone got a question? Add the comments. So if you've got a question, I see Audrey saying, nice to see me again. I saw Audrey only, was it on Tuesday? No, it was Monday, that's right, when I was in London. I've been moving back and forth, everything, avoiding this storm that seems to have been affecting so many people uh, through more luck than judgment. But yes, as people move around the country again, I'm, I'm finding myself in London a number of times and uh, enjoying the city in a new light, not living there. It's an interesting thing. I see Cindy already saying that she's surviving the second storm. It was very cold. It's uh, hopefully not affecting you all too much. But what better hobby than family history when it's cold outside it's starting to rain it's starting to snow then you have something that you can do indoors safe perhaps with something warm to drink and maybe as christmas starts coming a mince pie or so i hope you enjoy mince pies with something i'm quite a fan of brandy cream with mine but uh, that's probably another question i see everyone else hi heather says it's a cold and wet edinburgh yes it definitely is i can see it's already almost dark and it's only four o'clock uh, I see lots and lots of other people saying hello as well from all kinds of different parts of the world, from Stoke, uh, from Utah, from Illinois, Norfolk. It's fantastic. It's great. And uh, um, you're always welcome here. Uh, so uh, let's see. We've got some other things coming through. I'd say Williams had his uh, COVID jab number three on Monday and uh, six years ago and since the last big storm in Cumbria. So that's the one. I see uh, it's uh, one of those uh, things. And, and Karen has said she's late from London. I would never say you're late, Karen, just fashionable. That's what we say. So it's always important to be fashionable. No one can ever be late. And uh, yes, so there we have it. Uh, it seems everyone is here and we've got some great questions already. And uh, so let's get started. Let's see what we've got. We've got a number of early questions. I'm going to start with one of those straight away. Uh, there was one from Mary Beaumont, who's looking for a John Thomas Barber Beaumont. He added Beaumont to his name in 1812, and she wants to know who his parents were and when he was born. He started the county fire office and a bank. He raised the Queen's sharpshooters. He has a chair at Queen's College, still has miniature paintings in the Portrait Museum. His father-in-law was a roadmaker to the Queen, but who were his ancestors? After five decades of searching, nothing. So that gives you lots and lots of places to start looking. You'll, you'll probably find a number of second or third hand bits of information. You'll get biographies written of people like this in a number of places. Perhaps these organizations will write a little biography about their founder. Perhaps you'll find some details in uh, the Queen's Sharpshooters Museum or anything like that, or the people that now their successor organization may be. 
Uh, I'm not too up on which regiment became which in the 70s, 80s, 90s and beyond. So you may need to just follow that through Wikipedia, something like that. Uh, said the county fire office might be an idea, the local bank. All of these places might have these different things. Uh, Queen's College, that's another place to look because they will have records of their alumni and those kind of people as well. But try and get as many of them as you can because as they are second, third hand information, even things like when we think things like Burke's peerage and all those things that we find in the books, the ancient tombs of uh, all of those bits of genealogy knowledge, uh, we think that they're like the law, they're, they're Bibles in their own right. And not quite because they were committed to paper by genealogists and genealogists can be as wrong as we can. So don't take it as a guaranteed fact. Take it as a a guide for some more information. So if you can get as many of these as you can in a row and find them in as many different places, see what they all say and see if there's some kind of consensus or outliers or anything like that. Take every single one and investigate every single avenue of opportunity, but see if there's a consensus and see where that consensus may have come from. Start to lay them out. So I'm assuming, uh, as I'm looking through the comments, it said there's someone has written a little bit with a bit of a... Uh, possible idea but no proof so that's a good start you've got one uh, avenue but keep broadening things around and if you're looking at the uh, late 1700s as well there are all kinds of other records uh, that relate to placing someone there are things like rate books there are other things that can place a possible family and then don't be afraid of following the person that you think there's no way I can prove it's this person, follow them forward and see what happens to them. If they disappear at the time that your uh, John Thomas Barber Beaumont moved to a different part of the country or something like that, or started appearing in records in a different part of the country, maybe that's him. Or maybe there's something else we need to work out. So don't be afraid of doing other people's family tree for a little bit. And said, so hopefully that will help you uh, to get a little bit further. Let's see if we've got any more live comments as and questions we see. When talking about their uh, different things, you're saying that uh, Katie's saying there's sunshine today in Salt Lake City, snow tomorrow. Well, that's uh, one of those uh, things that uh, I do like the Salt Lake City snow, but it can get a little smoggy, can't it? And uh, oh, we've got one from Janine who's a uh, question for the community as well. Has anyone ever tried to get person, uh, people in a certain geographic area to take a DNA test to determine if they're related? It sounds incredibly awkward, but it's what a genetic genealogist has suggested in my never ending attempt to identify the parentage of my four times great grandfather born in 1778 in the American colonies. But why DNA points to a father or father's line from Southwest County Cork? I would say if you're just looking for people in an area and you're trying to do DNA testing, it might prove to be quite an expensive undertaking, and particularly when you're you're looking at a corner of a county, which you know, it takes up a lot of different communities in different places. It's almost like, you know, uh, firing a shotgun. You know, you, it's, it's very sort of almost random. Uh, if you've got the money, then, yeah, it might be worth it. But there might be a more efficient use of your resource by perhaps if you've got this idea of a, a line that you have an idea, then work through that family tree and try and find as many descendants as possible that you can start to test instead rather than looking at a location. And so those people may not still be in the area. They might be elsewhere. They might have moved to Australia. They may be in France or Sweden or Britain or America, anywhere else. All of those people still will have a much higher chance of having the DNA that you need. Because if we look in a location, there could be hundreds, thousands, even millions of people that have passed through or in there now and maybe have moved from elsewhere. And so that can really become uh, something that will be just more chance than anything else. And if you do manage to do that and you do get uh, a success, then that's brilliant. But I would also buy all the lottery tickets you can for that week because it seems like that's a, a really uh, bold one. And uh, I think uh, congratulations, but there might be a few more efficient ways to do that. So it's a really nice idea. And I'd love one day to do something like that with a tiny village and try and work out a little bit more about where they all came from but that would be more of a pet project than trying to find these different identities. And when you're looking for those sort of identifying parentage and things like that, I would definitely try and work through, get your plausible possible matches and start to work out, see if they have siblings, they have descendants, nephews, nieces, and then start working from there and see what you can find to get hold of people who could do DNA testing for you. All right, let's see what else we've got. Um, oh, okay. Uh, Sally's asked a question. We chat about Q. What can we see? Can we just roll up? Is it free? Tell us what goes on there. Well, Q, the National Archives of 
the UK, although there are national organizations in Scotland and Wales and other places as well that also hold national records. But for the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and many of the places that were formerly administered by uh, that uh, nation, uh, there are many records at the National Archives in Kew. It's a very big building, very brutalist building, if you like that style of architecture, with a lot of wonderful uh, wildlife in the pond outside. You will see, if you follow their Twitter or anything like that, you'll see lots of photos of those. They contain lots and lots of documents. Many of them have been digitized and scanned, and they've been published online. And many of them also haven't at all. And so there are lots of records that you can go through. You have to get a reader's ticket. So you'll have to uh, just make sure you bring your proofs of identity. And you can find on the website what you need to make sure you can get that. And then you will uh, take a look at certain documents. You can go through page by page and read things. You can see what you're looking for. Maybe the records that you need for your ancestor aren't published online. And you have to just go through the old fashioned way. There are millions of records that aren't yet online. Archives are a great source of lots and lots of different documentary records. And it's definitely a place to go. The National Archives with a national collection. They have their own catalog, which helps you go through and see what they may have. Of course, not all of that is searchable by name. You may well just have to look for a kind of record and look inside when you get there. Particularly if you're interested in a particular town or village, you might find records relating to that village or that county. So that will be useful. They also have computers. So you can access websites like Farmer Past from there. Uh, you'll be able to access the 1921 census from there, for example. And all you need to do for there is just walk in and start searching. So you'll be able to take a look at all the, the records and see perhaps if the website's for you, or maybe also just uh, see if there's a particular record you want to look at. So there are lots of things you can do at the National Archives, either computer or by paper. And uh, they are a repository with a almost limitless number of amazing records that might really help. So really worth uh, visiting at some point just to explore some of those records. But of course, at the moment, um, it's going to be one of those times where it's a little harder to get to in, in current restrictions. So there are, uh, there are researchers that you may be able to hire who might be able to go on your behalf. Or, of course, there are some records that you can ask the National Archives to send you a copy of and you can obtain, as well as they've got their own records, some of them that you can just buy instantly, uh, digitally, for a few pounds as well. Let's see what else we've got. Um, no question of the week, Fee. This is a, just the genealogy question and answer. So the questions of the week come from you. Anything that you can think of that relate to uh, your family history that we can maybe work through and maybe get you a little bit further? say and the queue is great it is great fun uh, there's a good link there from ellie more details about the national archives what you do when you visit there it is really interesting to go to any archive if you've never been to an archive or library maybe you've only been doing online research or something like that i know right now it's a little more difficult but definitely consider going for a day set some time aside particularly in an area that you have some interest because just looking at what's available, seeing there, it gives you a new sense of appreciation for what happens when you can search digitally. And it also might well give you something great to find something really interesting that they have because not everything is online. We're doing our best, but there's certainly plenty of other things to discover that can be anywhere you can imagine inside an archive or library. I've got a good question from Daphne. John Searchfield, a carpenter born 1530 in Wiltshire. Am I likely to get any further back the problem with research in this kind of period is usually that the records that are created relate to people with money because that's when it's worth writing things down. If there's money to be had, usually then records will follow. And so it depends entirely on the kind of class of your carpenter. And carpentry is one of those things where you can have village carpenters who are you know very very working class and hand to mouth and not earning too much money or you can have master carpenters that that make the finest cupboards and beds and all kinds of things and, and they will be in a very different situation so the job itself doesn't give you that much to go on what you really need to do is start to take a look and parish records if you're very lucky will get you back to 1538 and you can maybe get for people who are a little bit younger, you might get some details in a marriage. However, of course, early parish registers don't give you the same detail you'll get later on. So even when you find a marriage, you might just have John Searchfield and Mary Smith married. And it doesn't tell you anything else, which is a nightmare. It's absolutely terrible. That can happen quite a lot in the very early records. So 
what you need to really sort of look at then is perhaps if he's a carpenter, there may be a few records of perhaps some kind of apprenticeship or anything like that. Although, again, that's fairly early for any kind of formalized system. So there are a few more. And in the apprenticeship system that was brought in with the Tudors was a little bit afterwards as well. But there are records if he had a bit of money. Uh, he may well have left a will if he was, again, so one of the uh, more wealthy carpenters. And if he did, then uh, that would be, at this point, from one of two places. The wills would be administered by the Prerogative Court of York or the Prerogative Court of Canterbury. And so the whole country was split in two. So I think Wiltshire is Canterbury, I believe. Well, you might have to just check that and then take a look at these wills. I know they say Canterbury, but don't be afraid. That was just the name of the archdiocese that dealt with it. Uh, so it was administered by the church probate right until 1858. And so take a look at those wills and see if you can find a search field. Search field is luckily one of those names that's not so common. So you might find something. And inside, when you find the will, you'll know pretty quickly if you've got the right name. And if you've got the right occupation, you'll find some more details. The will might give you more and it might possibly tell you about siblings. It might tell you about other things. If he's born 1530, there's a chance and it's a very, very slim chance. But with family history, we've got to take it that they may have siblings that were born after parish records were enacted. And you have parish registers in that parish back to 1538. So they may be an elder sibling. And there may be someone who's born a little later and you might get the parents from there. There's a few different little gambles, little rolls of the dice that we can do to try and fill in the gap. It is difficult, but there's still a few things to do. And if you've got back that far anyway, 1530, that is something to be pretty excited about and then flesh things out a little more. But I definitely think there are a few more things that you could possibly do. Uh, so don't give up hope yet. But yeah, you're definitely on the, uh, the, 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 the cutting edge of family history. Let's see what else we have. Oh, a good question from Ellen. Coats of Arms. She has two genealogy books for her Witter side, published in 1929 and 1992, that show two somewhat different coats of arms. Is there a reason why they will be different, or are they even real? I can see the look on Ellie's face. Do I know exactly? She knows what's about to happen, and I think people who have been here for a long time know exactly what's about to happen. Coats of Arms. It's like tartan. Ah, let's start. Um, I'm going to be as polite as possible. The coats of arms that you go to a uh, Blackpool or Southport or anything like that and buy a key ring with a coat of arms or anything like that, it's nonsense. It's not true at all. It's not the way. There are, are no coats of arms for a family name. It's not a thing that exists. I'm sure Ellie has seen many Jones coats of arms. You can probably buy 50 different ones, but they aren't your coat of arms. It's not the Jones family crest. What happens when you get these coats of arms and they're made? They're made for a person who might have had that surname. So they may be a James Jones in the 1720s that gets the coats of arms and all of their descendants. So anyone who's descended from that person can use that coat of arms and that's how it will all work. But there are many other Joneses that are nothing to do with that James Jones, and they also may have done something or acquired their own coat of arms at some point. So that's why you'll end up with a number of different coats of arms relating to a particular person or a particular surname, because what these companies have done is they've taken the surname and found coats of arms relating to a certain person with that surname and said, there you go, that's your coat of arms. And it might well be, but you have to do the research to go further back until you find the person who has been granted that coat of arms and it descends from there. There are books called armorials that might help you. There are other things. There are visitations, lots of books that you can use to find this stuff from the 1600s and, and from later on as well. But until you can find your connection to that person who's been granted the coat of arms, it's not really your coat of arms. It's just something from someone with that surname. And, you know, it's difficult to, to say that is yours. There are some lovely Cleland coats of arms, but I have not a scrap of any right to use them because I am not descended from the person that has that as far as I know. Maybe later on I'll prove it and then I can put a nice shield and crest right behind me. However, until then, that, that wall will remain blank. So it's one of those things that it's one of those simple mistakes to make. 
And a lot of people will will encourage you to make that mistake because you can then get your coat of arms and you can pay them some money to have it on a scroll or a poster or a tea towel or anything else. But that is a separate thing. And it means even more, we have to lean on proper genealogy to get to the records that we need. So there we have it, Ellen. I have calmed down now. I'll take a, a sip of uh, orange and I will uh, return to sanity. But uh, yes, it's one of those things that you definitely uh, are completely forgiven for having seen those and got excited. But it's a little more complicated than those people will sometimes lead you to believe. Sue has asked a question, am I exhausted after my Twitter marathon? Well, we'll probably maybe talk more about that on Friday. But that is, again, partially something that is entirely Ellie's fault. And um, <laughs> and when when Friday comes around, We'll, we'll leave that teasing there and uh, maybe we'll have a chat about that Twitter thing that happened, with, that Ellie made me do, that uh, happened in all kinds of different ways. Audrey has made a mention about the National Archives. Can we remind people to start with the research guides rather than diving into catalogue? That's a good point. So there's a link there from Audrey Collins, who is at the National Archives. Uh, there are some great research guides that will give you a little bit more information when you start running through your journey. Uh, question here from Nicole. I have a three times great grandfather named George Rintel. He is a brick wall on my paternal side. I'm struggling to find his birth record. He states he was born in 1840 to 41, but I can't find a record for him. He's even written down as a mariner, but still no luck on finding him. Any tips? He was born in Liverpool, but that's about it on what I can get. Although civil registration came in, uh, it was mandated from 1837, the amount of records, you know, people might assume that it's comprehensive straight away from day one, and it wasn't. It was a little rough and patchy to begin with. And so we're not really too sure about the numbers that have been missed, but some people have been missed. My great great grandmother, unfortunately, she was born in 1860 can't find a civil record, none at all, there's nothing. And the same, you'll get people that will fall through the cracks. So there's a chance that birth record won't be found if you're looking at civil records. But there are baptisms. And if you're looking at Liverpool, then of course, many people uh, in Liverpool came from Wales, many people from Liverpool came from Ireland. And then we've got to start looking at there. Maybe, perhaps, they will be of a different faith. So in Liverpool, you maybe need to look at Catholic records to see if they maybe came from Ireland, or maybe look at nonconformist records if they came from Wales, because there was a point in Wales that uh, Welsh history that four in five people were nonconformists. There really was a, a real renaissance of uh, nonconformist church building in Wales uh, just around about this time. Uh, so. There are a few other places to look where if you've only looked at parish records from the Church of England to see if you can find a baptism. The name sounds like it is one of those things that possibly could slip a little bit. So I would use wild cards. We've always talked about wild cards. We always get excited about wild cards. Uh, they are the asterisk. If you're not sure which letters to use, it could be no letters. It could be lots of letters. Or uh, if you know there's a letter there and you're not sure what the letter might be, you put a question mark and that question mark could help because that E in Rintel could look like an O perhaps, it could look like something else. And so you can make sure that you'll find more relatives and more records when you use those wildcards. So I'd use those as well. But certainly I would start with those records, start with different records of different faiths in the Liverpool area. Get to the censuses, 1851, 1861, 71, lay them all out, see when each one who it says that their parents are, everything else. If you've got details of him with family as well, follow those family too. Try and build out the whole, um, you know, the whole surroundings of him, his life, the people that he works and lives with. Uh, all of those might have a clue, but certainly his parents, his uncles, aunts, anyone he's with when he's in the country. There's a lot of merchant seamen records we have from the merchant navy. Uh, those are on fire my past. Take a look at those. They might help you a little bit. They will give you the voyages that someone is on. So those voyages will be really helpful because you'll know when he's out of the country. If you can't find him in a census, that will really help. But those sheets give you numbers. And those numbers, when you look at that sheet, that Merchant Navy sheet, you'll see something like 652, March 8th, 1861, uh, 618, uh, June 7th, 
1861. And what these numbers are is they relate to different ports that this ship has been to and where this person has been. But if you go to that all record sets and you type in, you know, merchant navy and you get to that record collection, if you go to that collection on the right hand side, you'll find a glossary of all of the different codes and what they mean. So you'll then be able to see exactly which port he was at and where and when. So that will really, really help you, I think. So those are a few different ways to go through. Censuses, yep, yeah, start with 51, maybe even try 1841, although there are a few gaps at that sort of point in that kind of area. I know there's definitely a lot in North Wales that are missing, uh, but definitely worth a go. And then there's other churches as well. Lots of different records you can start looking at and using. Hopefully that will help you. Uh, as a mariner, you won't really get things like wills and things like that, but hopefully that is enough to get you started. Uh, Carol said, where are the Chelsea pensioner records kept? They're kept at the National Archives. So they're there at the moment, uh, I believe. Uh, but of course, they're all digitized and they're all available to search and to explore on Find My Past. So that would be where you would take a look. Uh, all the way, of course, up to 1920, when after that, records are stored by the Ministry of Defence, held there currently. And uh, so at the moment, you have to apply for those records if you're looking for something a little bit more modern. But there, I said, I would definitely start looking uh, online because that's a good, quick way of doing it. What do we have here? I'll uh, see, uh, see, where would I find birth records for someone born in Penang in Malaysia in 1922? We have a collection of overseas uh, and uh, at sea births, marriages and deaths from the GRO. And those are available in our record, all record sets glossary. So take a look at there and you may well find if they're British, then you might find them being registered by the British consulate and you'll find that detail in there and you might still be able to order their certificate. I have ordered a number of my family's records who were born in Libya. That's where my family was in North Africa from the 50s to the 70s. And so they are in that overseas collection. So take a look at that and that will be where I would look at. And I see uh, Ellie there sharing uh, about my session about tartans and crests and things like that. A really good idea to take a look at that if you want to learn more about those family crests, about those tartans, because I can't uh, continue to uh, uh, shout about my, my frustration with tartans and, and everything else. Um, so let's see what we have. Um, on birth certificates for twins or multiple births, have they always quoted the time of birth for the firstborn? That's a very good question. And that is one I don't know the answer to. So if anyone here who has a bit of knowledge will be able to answer that, that would be great. I love it when we can throw things over to the community and maybe someone has an answer. So uh, that's an interesting one. And I'd like to know that one as well. So you know, no one knows everything. So uh, let's uh, hope uh, that someone else might have an answer there. What do we have here? See, Audrey is saying, I once found some correspondence in 1910 in the Society of Genealogists from someone inquiring about the coat of arms his family had been using for a couple of centuries. On investigation, it turned out some dodgy geezer had sold someone else's arms to his ancestor. Oh dear, well, this does happen. It's one of those big things. And uh, so, yes, it's definitely one of those. Uh, what we've got here. Roxanne makes a good point. I think we're oddly conditioned in the States to believe these things. Tartans, coats of arms and things are tied to a name, not a specific family or person. Yeah, no idea until she saw the session. It's not a, a problem in the sense that if it brings you joy and makes you happy, then no one should ever stop you from doing anything that makes you happy. That's something that I'm always a fan of. Tartans, if you want to wear a particular tartan, although it was only in the 1820s, that this really took off. Now, I guess it's a, a new tradition. So it's not the tradition of centuries, but it's been a tradition for the past 180 years or whatever. And so now it's maybe a, a new part of Scottish history that just came a lot more recently than we might expect. But there's nothing wrong with just choosing a tartan that you enjoy the look of or something like that. And there's no one that should again tell you that you can't do it or anything like that. There are some rules in relation to using a coat of arms in some way that might mislead people or anything like that. So there are some laws in relation to uh, coats of arms, particularly in Scotland, where there's a whole court, the court of the Lord Lion, who will, uh, it sounds very fantastical, like something from Narnia, but they will really come down hard on people that perhaps try and use a coat of arms without the rights to use it. 
But if you're doing your family history and you like a tartan, you want to buy a scarf when you get to Edinburgh in the tartan that's your family tartan or anything like that, even though your ancestors might never have seen it, if you get an attachment to it and you enjoy it, then still buy it and enjoy it and wear it with pride or do whatever. But there are people also that might just come in and like that pattern. And also they've got just as much right to wear it as you have. Everyone should just enjoy themselves. So it's true that um, some people really attach a lot of emotional significance to that kind of tartan or that coat of arms. But if we know the history, it sometimes can give it even more significance if we know exactly the story behind it. So there's definitely lots and lots of different reasons. I see something here from Lisa. Uh, my father was a twin and the time he was born is not listed. So that's interesting. And Anya has said she's had twins born with certificates in Scotland where it gave a time to the children's birth and noted them as first and second at the side. So that is interesting. It's nice to see a bit of a difference. I did suspect it might be down to the registrar, but it is one of those things as well um, that is very interesting. Uh, so what have we got here? Oh, so Diane has said, my seven times great grandmother was a servant to James Alexander in Perth. Um, he was a writer in 1751. Can't find much about him. Maybe he wasn't very good. So Diane, the term writer in Scotland does not refer to a writer of books. It means a lawyer. So he would have been a lawyer. So I would take a look at some of the different societies that involve lawyers. Uh, possibly if he's in Perth, he may have had some time in Edinburgh. He may have also done other things in Dundee or Perth. There's other places he may have been. Uh, writers were people who've been to university. You might find him in university graduation lists, particularly take a look at the University of Aberdeen and the University of Edinburgh, which were around at that sort of time because they're very old institutions. But that will be why there is a collection of lawyers coming to find my past from Scotland, going all the way back to the 1500s, very, very soon indeed. So keep your eyes peeled for that. It's a little secret sneak peek. But definitely there are more details you can find. It's just a matter of the different lingo to, to get your head around. Scotland has many different Scots terms that they use that you, you kind of always have to go back to the start and start picking up all the different words as things go through. Uh, but it's really useful whenever you start researching a different country to start trying to get all that historical and local context. So that is why. So uh, he may have written things in addition, but as he's listed as a writer, it would be just because he was a lawyer. So that would be the one to look for. So that would be why. So we've got here. Ah, Nicole said they've got a coat of arms in their paternal side since the 1900s. They never knew what the symbols meant that it came with their three times great grandfather from Germany. Now, the... The, the practice of reading those symbols, again, I think is in that presentation that Ellie shared. It's called uh, a bla blazoning or blazoning. And uh, there is a, a complete school of thought and a, a way to learn how to do it and how to describe things because they like list them in a way that another herald would be able to recreate that coat of arms without ever having seen it. So they write in a very specific formula to describe a coat of arms and they go through. So if you have a coat of arms and you want to learn more about what it is, you can then learn that blazon or the blazon and then you can find that. Sometimes you can Google that. And also, if you know how to do it, then you can write it out and then you can search and you can then find which coat of arms that family is. So if you're in perhaps a church, maybe an older church or an old cemetery, and you find a coat of arms on a stone, maybe the stone has worn away a little bit and you can't quite read the surname. If you can look at that coat of arms and you know how to blazon or blazon, so I don't know the pronunciation, it, everyone disagrees on how to pronounce it, so I'm trying to be fair-handed, but then you can write it out and you can then find the family that it relates to. I know uh, Ellie and I did that once when we walked through uh, the Howth Cemetery in Dundee, taking one of those and looking through, and I found it was a Ramsey family just by looking at that coat of arms and learning, you know, knowing how to, to read what, what it was uh, by blazoning it and then uh, going backwards into an armorial which would describe what it was and give a good example of what it looked like. It looked exactly as it was on the stone, so it was very easy to then know we were looking at the same family. I think he was a provost of Dundee. Uh, provost, of course, being the Scots for mayor, we have provosts as well. So there we go. Sylvia is there with some support, a good website. 
to help you understand lots of different Scottish words. So that's uh, really, really good to use. Lots of different things that will help. Uh, Sally is mother to twins. They're only, uh, only 25, but definitely have the times noted on their birth certificates. I wondered about my grandfather, who was also a twin. His sister sadly died very shortly after birth. Well, I'm sorry to hear that one. Uh, but uh, it's, it is really fascinating to see all of these differences when it comes to the uh, the way that things have been listed as twins. Karen's grandfather and her twin show the time both were born. She was first born. And Audrey says there's instructions here that the instructions to registrars from 1837 said that the time of birth should be recorded for all multiple births. There we go. So what else have we got here? Um, see i'm trying to go through on you said when they were in school they had black watch tartan hat they used to wear not knowing they had a direct ancestor who was in the 42nd regiment during the napoleonic wars right it's interesting how these things come full circle we really like that uh so uh, yes it's uh, one of those interesting things and uh yes there's lots and lots of people talking about tartans and heraldry that's great uh i see there's lots going on uh it's one of the the, the great little parts of family history that it's the, one of the most colourful, so it's one that we can get more excited about because it's something to look at. But then I'm always excited by a good old-fashioned record. There are some great old records uh, that are in the pipeline as well, as well as the great ones that are already on Far My Past. Roxanne's paternal grandparents were both twins, but she's yet to find the birth certificates for her grandmother and her sister. My grandfather and his brother were actually born a couple of days apart, so it's very obvious who was first in their case. I don't recall their times being noted. I could be wrong. A couple of days apart. Wow, that, that's uh, some labour. That's going to be <laughs> something that's notable. Wow, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Oh, I've, I've heard that before. Uh, Nicole's paternal side, where the coat of arms comes from, is real horn. You might think it'd be an easy name to search for. Spelling mistakes are a nightmare with the searching. The amount of birth records I've had to put errors uh, for just because they've had spelt it wrong is annoying. It is one of those things. So those wild cards will really help you out. They're really good to use for. And there are lots and lots. Um, uh, Sylvia is, is looking for some legislation to quote uh, because she's using it in her thesis as well. James has said he's just come in. No reminder from Facebook. Well, Facebook is um, a law unto itself, but we're, we're always here every month. So if you missed a little bit and you still got time to get your questions in. So if you've got a question, you can bring that in. If not, uh, don't worry. We're here every month to do the same sort of thing. I imagine next month is going to be possibly slightly tinged towards a certain big record collection that might be coming out that you might have some questions about. Maybe you've had a go and had a look and decided that there's uh, something you need to know about that particular collection. So watch that space, but always a second Wednesday, and then you have me on the second uh, Friday as well. So we'll have a, a more relaxed look at different uh, things of the week when we do our Fridays. John has brought in his second great-grandfather, Alexander Robertson, was a solicitor. Was he described as a writer or something similar in census records? And they're saying there he's Scottish, so that will be it. You see, writer is, that's the Scottish word for solicitor, for lawyer. So uh, that will be what it is. So writer here, it's, uh, you know, you have writers to the signet, you have writers, they're all lawyers. So that's, that's what we're going for there. It's one of those things that you'll find in censuses and lots of other things as well. Uh, let's see. Um, Heather's asked, do not all Scottish birth certificates have time of birth, whether multiple or single? I've only really come across single births, so I can't really tell you too much about the, the multiple. But there have been a couple of people here that have said that they've used Scottish birth certificates and they've seen in twins uh, multiple times of birth. So we're going with the community on this one. I just haven't been lucky enough to get twins in my family. So I haven't ever had a chance to take a look for them for myself. Uh, let's see what we've got. Um, I see Nicole says she can't wait for the 1921 census. That is one of those things definitely that is going to solve so many mysteries. And uh, I'm sure you'll come back with a host of new ones. I see a question from Darren. Um, a brick wall with a right a great grandfather on my father's side of the family. The 1911 census says there are two families of littles living three doors away from each other that have the same names in both households. Confused as to who my real great grandfather is. Well, this is one of those things that you have to work forwards to find out a bit more. You have to try and use civil birth, marriage, and deaths and see what's going on. If we're looking at a particular place, depending on where they are, depending on how big the area is, we can start using parish records, start using other things. But 
don't be afraid to do the two families bit of family history because one of them will rule themselves out for some reason or other. Perhaps if you find details of, and you don't mention perhaps their occupations, maybe that might be slightly different. Because if the occupations are different, when you look at a marriage record, you'll see the father and father's occupation, and then that will tell you if you've got the right family there. And if one of them's different, you'll say, well, from that point on, they've changed. Uh, if depending on the age, the 1921 census might be perfect to help because you might then see that one family has uh, moved away or one particular family suddenly has different people in the household and maybe that might help you give you the clue. So there are a few different ways you could do, but I, I would start building up both just to, just to see where one of them goes and you can always then delete that family, the other family, or you can keep them, keep them on the side just in case they come back and maybe they're related further down the line. But definitely don't be afraid of doing someone else's family tree for a little while if you're ruling something in or out. So that's a really, really big, useful tip. Although, yes, the 1921 census will be a definite one. It will be a definite thing that will help you a lot. And it's so close. It might be one of those things that we uh, certainly uh, will be uh, digging into. And I'm sure when you come back, I'm sure your, your little family uh, will be a little bit bigger. And uh, that will be uh, something that will start a whole new set of other questions to go for. Janine said, Farmer Pass should do a webinar on favorite recipes from various areas. Well, that could be interesting. I'm sure there are plenty of uh, great midweek sessions we could do. So that would be something that uh, maybe we could take a look at. What else do we have? Okay. So let's see as we go through. Catherine has said she has a weird brick wall. Her great-great-grandmother seems to have adopted a middle name towards the end of her life and given her father's name and a marriage certificate incorrectly. Having fun confirming what I do have. Is there other weird records that might help solve and help going back on the line? Middle names and things like that do tend to appear sometimes, don't they? They're quite a strange one. If you've got a birth certificate, which might give you things like a middle name or anything, then that's great. But they do just happen. I've seen them a number of times. They've just appeared out of nowhere and we don't know where they've come from. When you are asked about details of parents and this kind of thing at a wedding, you give that over. So they may have decided that they wanted to change it. Perhaps they had a stepfather or perhaps maybe they saw someone they thought was their father. Maybe they were too young to know their real father and maybe there's a stepfather involved or something like that. Maybe they just didn't like their father. They gave someone else's name. There's all these different reasons. So it could be a mistake. It could be intentional. There's a lot of different plausible reasons why it could happen. And we can't put in our own you know story to something until we know a bit more because you know all of them are plausible we also don't want to badmouth people who can't defend themselves they're not here to do it themselves so um it's an interesting one and as you said if you've proven that the father's name is different what i would do then is start researching the the new supposed father and see who that person is and see where they connect into your life and your family's life because that might give you the story that might prove what's gone on there. It might give you a bit more information. Um, when you're trying to prove things in terms of middle names, if they appear great, search that middle name. But with all middle names, they're used you know, randomly sometimes. We look at records and sometimes you'll find them all with a middle name, which always is great because we know exactly we've got the right person. Other times they disappear again and we don't get them. So use both always. If you think someone has a middle name, search them with the middle name, search them without. and Keep checking and flipping between the two because that gives you the most chance of searching and finding what you're looking for. The big thing, the thing that matters, the one thing that matters in this is finding the records that you need. And so, yeah, try everything. It's like using a combination lock. And what we're doing here is I'm helping you to sharpen a key, but the key is yours. And if you will, you have a ring full of keys, try every key. Don't just use one and say, ah, it doesn't work and walk away. There's lots and lots of different other techniques and other ways we can get through to help and to find more about our ancestors. What else do we have as we go through? As I scroll through, here we go. Um, Jennifer said, if an illegitimate child with no father's name was subsequently baptized at 13 years with the father's name listed, did the father have to be at the baptism in person? Uh, I have not known of a requirement for the father to be present in at the baptism. If the father's name is given, then it's given and it can be put in there. But I don't think they have to be there together for that to happen. So there's a number of reasons why they, they may not be. Um, I mean, usually they would, but no, it doesn't mean that they wouldn't get baptized. So 
uh, I would say that it didn't mean that that person's there. You'd have to use other records to maybe see where that father is, or even sometimes if that father's still alive, because that could be a post, uh, uh, you know, a post mortem. Uh, you know, after the father has died, they can be the child can be baptized. And if they're thirteen, it is possible they may have passed away. So there's all the different things that we might have to look at or think about. Um, Carol said her twins in the 1970s had the time listed. Not sure about earlier. My husband's grandfather was a twin born in the late 1800s, and the elder town's name was listed. Uh, the elder twin's name was listed first, but no time. Okay, that's interesting. So it's interesting how we've got all these different ones that come through these different ways of doing it. Uh, let's see what we have here. Some more questions. Um, Roxanne has asked, how do I determine if a surname is misspelled or just a different name? Looking at someone that was listed on the census from a five times great grandfather, when I do a search for Mary Brady, I also get Mary Brady. Both look like they could be the right person, as well as both showing up like they could be different people. Think about the record that you're looking at and try and think about why that record was created and who created it. Think about the people in the record, and this goes for all the records that you might use. That little bit of extra, just take a step back and just think think can really help to frame everything that you think about and the way you understand the different records so if you're looking at a census the census would have you know, the forms have been given to everyone in the household or not to the head of the household they would have filled in all the details about their family if they could read and write and if they could do then that will be copied into an enumerator's book and then the enumerator's book all the way up to 1911. So in 1911, we have the original forms. Before then, we have the enumerator's books. And those books will be what we see and use for family history in, in Britain anyway. But perhaps that person couldn't read and write. And so then the enumerator would have to fill that in for them and would help them to fill it in. And maybe they would mishear something. Maybe they this person has traveled from somewhere far away. Maybe they've come from Birmingham and they now live somewhere in Scotland. And so someone has no idea how to understand that accent. There's so many different things that might mean that something's spelled a little wrong or someone's heard something and they say, well, my name is Brady. And then someone says, oh, it must be Brady and written something down. Think about who's doing the writing and, and whether your relative would have been able to, probably if they would have had any education and whether they would have been able to write something themselves. Look at their signatures rather than the things that have been written. If you look at, say, a marriage record or something like that, look at the signatures of the people involved if they can sign their own name, because the priest may have misheard, but when they're writing their own name, they're far more likely to get it right. So there's all these different ways that you can look at things and see, but just so to think about that context of who's writing, when are they writing, are the people likely to have the same sort of accent? Sometimes even just listening to some of those accents on YouTube or something like that and just hearing the difference might give you an idea how someone could have easily made a mistake. There's all kinds of different ways around this problem. But that bit of extra context and thought can really, really help to frame what we're thinking. So in terms of a census, Brady and Brady, they're so close. There's every plausibility that one of those could be right. If you've got a Brady that makes perfect sense, uh, then yes, but then of course, if there's a Brady, then you know that could well be them too. Uh, again, start working on the other person and see where they go. See if they're in the same house ten years later. Use our address search on the census and see if you can work forwards and see if you know you're still looking at that same family in there and your family is somewhere else and you know they're provably somewhere else. Then you then know that that's definitely not the person you're looking for. There's lots and lots of different ways to get through this. But that time to sit and do the context is is really, really useful. And I do that all the time. And it's one of my um, favorite uh, ways to get a new view of a problem. And uh, it's really, really helpful, particularly also it might give me an idea about where I might find other records. If I think about my ancestor being a, a gunlock maker, then I will think, OK, well, what was their life like? How much money did they earn? What kind of education would they have had? Who would they have hung around with? Where would they have gone? Uh, what was the industry like at the time? And then it helps me think about any more records that might appear as well. And then if I use things like local gazettes, I can learn about that industry. And I can learn about the growth of that industry. And then perhaps if they move away, I can't find them. I look at gazettes for a little bit after they've gone. And it might tell me that that industry has suddenly randomly been decimated or there's some reason 
uh, particularly when it comes to people who made those gun locks and, and some of my ancestors in Staffordshire, they were very, very rich when all the Napoleonic Wars were going on and the British government were buying guns hand over fist. They would be able to work for one or two days a week and they would have three different kinds of meats. They'd have turkey, beef and chicken, all of their meals. They'd have a bottle of wine with every meal. They were some of the richest people that you could find in the country and they weren't particularly qualified, weren't anything else, but they were just skilled at making these parts of guns. And then after the war stopped, almost overnight, the money dried up. These people were almost penniless. They could only afford bread and water. And they really, really fell on hard times. And many of them had to turn to crime to survive. Lots and lots of things. You know, my own ancestor was sentenced to death for forgery, for, you know, that's high treason. He was making fake coins. Lots of other stories like that from the area, from those people who were just suddenly their whole lives had transformed and their whole careers had transformed because circumstances around the world and that local context has changed so much. So that bit can really, really help you too. So uh, let's see what we've got here. So we've got some more questions. Um, what have we got here? I'm just running through. Uh, Daphne's saying she loves all the facts and figures, trip off our tongues and all of our presenters. It's true. Uh, we, we just hoover up and we acquire all of this knowledge from doing this all the time and it's not something that is reserved to us the more you interact and use these different records the more you'll be able to do it too and the more these things will start to reappear in your mind and as you get used to certain records you will be an expert in your own right at whatever collections you tend to use so it just comes with using them over and over and using them repeatedly and when you get used to a certain area and knowledge of a certain location that is when you really start to uh, come into your own and you can really do some great stuff what we have here uh, Karen said they've got quite a few ancestors who seem to add middle names even though they didn't have one on the birth certificate I've seen that a lot Karen I've seen it happen a number of times so it's one of those things that will uh, definitely pop up again and again what have you got here oh I've seen lots of conversation going about the 1921 census more comments about twins um, Sue has asked is there a 1921 census for Ireland there is not because of the Irish Civil War going on and the, the things going on in there. So uh, the looming Civil War and many things going on. Uh, 1926 will be their census. I'm looking forward to that one myself. I'm, I'm happy to hopefully get hold of my grandfather and uh, find some more detail. But uh, yes, we've got to wait for that. Uh, I don't know when that will appear, but uh, it'll be 1926 for the Irish census there. And uh, let's see what else we have here. So uh, Katha said they found their Fraser ancestry in Norfolk under Freezer. Must be how the accent was heard. So that's it. It is one of those uh, things that if we have to think a little bit outside the box and use those wild cards, use different things, that will really, really help to get us a little bit further. So it is a, a great thing to, to take that step back. I uh, see what we have here. Um, what we've got here. Oh, say so, that you know, I'm... Um, saying I've got people from everywhere. I think we all have. We just have to do the research to find them. That's uh, one of those uh, um, fun parts of family history. So definitely there's plenty of people to look for. I didn't have anyone to look up for in the 1921 census until recently, but now I have some ancestors to look at. So I'm as excited as you are, although I was always excited for the census. I was going to live vicariously for all of you, and now I have some people to look for. So I'm going to get very, very excited, and I'm joining in with this um, thrill that is and the uh, 1921 census. So uh, Patricia has asked, do we have um, any records about women in flight? Well, finding women in records is something that is deserving of its own presentation. I believe there may be one or two already in our library of records, uh, library of presentations. I think Mary McKee does a very good one, but there are some other records that might help and there are certainly some records that i know of that we're working on that would be of great interest so there are some more and i can't tell you what they are just yet but um there will definitely be some to talk about soon enough so uh, don't worry but there are plenty already we've got records of suffragettes and we've also got many records where women will appear and they might not be as prominent as men, but they still are available to be found. And sometimes you have to use different extra techniques to find them. But there's plenty of ways to get hold of them. And that's uh, one of those really important things because, of course, it's um, perhaps a little harder to find the names and the details of women in these records. 
uh, due to historical uh, aberrations, but uh, we're getting better and uh, there's definitely lots and lots of records that we can start to use and start to pull things together. So I see, uh, there we go. See James said, we talk about uh, transcriptions. Uh, James had Sweeney transcribed as Laverne. Well, that's one of those interesting ones. It might be down even to the handwriting. So that will be one of those. So that, uh, that can be something that can be all levels of skill. If we look at very early records, of course, those handwriting can be ooh, a little di difficult. As uh, education becomes far more established, Handwriting gets better, I think, so uh, it does get easier, but uh, certainly one of those uh, uh, things to think about and to look at. I think we are at the top of the hour. We have got to five o'clock, and so it seems like uh, we've done enough for this session, but don't forget, this is just one in a long line of sessions. And uh, if you have had a question that you haven't got answered this time, don't worry. There's the Find My Pass forum, which is open 24 seven. It's there for all of you, a wonderful community to share your questions, answers, thoughts, feelings. And then of course, uh, we'll be back again in a month where you can ask questions in advance, or you can come here and you can drop off any question you can think of and we'll try and get to them and try and give you a little bit of a clue or some help. So uh, hopefully all of this has been interesting. Even if uh, you've been just sitting and watching, hopefully maybe it's inspired you or given you some clues or something you might be working on, or maybe you've just enjoyed having a chat about all things family history. And of course, on Friday, you'll be able to uh, hear about the latest records and we'll be talking about everything that's been going on this week in all things Find My Past and all things family history and uh, then we may just hear about the uh, little thing that we've uh, uh, talked about relating to Twitter and I will tell you the the fun story of uh, um, Ellie and I's um, interesting challenge that uh, went a little bit too far uh, and I like the comment and the phrase uh, that I bespoke too soon. So if you've seen it, you'll know what that is. But if not, wait till Friday and we'll reveal all. But uh, thank you very much for joining me and joining Ellie and joining all of us at Farmer Past. And it's as much your session as me shepherding it around. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all here. And it's great we can all share in family history. And I can't wait to see you on Friday. But we aren't just stopping at Friday. There's another great presentation on Thursday. So you'll see that here about the same time, I believe. And there's lots and lots to be getting on with in the meantime with working through our family trees. I think on Friday, there might be a, a question asking about what great things you've found this year as we start to run towards the end of the year. I'd love to hear some brilliant things. I'm sure I can dig something out of myself. And uh, it's always exciting to just talk more family history. So until then, have a great time. I hope you've done really well um, with new ideas and you're off to now break down all those brick walls and find some more answers. Uh, if not said, then uh, don't worry, you can come and commiserate with us again on Friday and uh, the records that might help you might be released this week. Who knows? So another great reason to tune in and hopefully we'll see you very, very soon. It's always great. And uh, so uh, best of luck and talk to you soon. In Bocca Lupo.